Welcome back everyone. Hope you had a nice and refreshed break. Um, as you can see, we're still joined with Zach Snaps and we're also joined with um, Esther Keith and Chuck Noble, who's on Zoom. Um, Zach, uh, thank you for the amazing masterclass you provided earlier on. Um, could you just reintroduce really yourself to our viewers who are just joining no us now? No problem. So yes, people, I go by the name of Zach, aka Zach Snaps. I am a Middle Eastern born British photographer that specializes in the world of music, commercial and fashion photography. I'm also a graduate of BA Film Studies through set designing and art directing, but as well, I do specialize in assistant directing and I am a podcast host of my very own podcast, which is called Zek Chats, which is a podcast that specializes in bringing different creatives from the creative industry to speak to them about championing themselves as a creative, cultivating the culture, bringing back to the community, how to become the best at what they do, the mental challenges ahead within their life that they face, and many other things that correlate to the world of creativity itself. So yes. Thank you. Um, and I can I know that um, people can see um, your show rule. Um, mm -hmm. Can you just tell us um, through your, your work, please? Yeah. So um, this I got a photo of an artist here called Pretty Boy Doe. He is from Nigeria. This was a fashion editorial shoot for Noctis magazine. It was super last minute, super stressful. I had to basically set design, bring all the fabrics, bring everything together. But I've got to give a massive shout out to the team that were there who really brought this whole shoot to life and really brought the true identity of it. And your next one is of um, J-Hubs, isn't it? I think it is, I'm not entirely sure. Was it Mix Money? Uh, yeah, do mix money, I think. That'd be good. Yeah, so this is um, an unreleased photo of mix money, actually. So if he finds out, he will absolutely kill me. But um, it's all good. It's all good. Um, so this is a portrait BTS photo at his music video. Um, so I like the way he styled himself. I think the style was very abstract, but very, very um, unique in terms of how he looks within his, um, how should I say, within his form as a character, as a music artist. And I felt, for me, it was quite interesting to bring the perspective of glares and flares, but as well as purplish tints and colours into it, because it brings that surreal imagination into life. And you would not expect it for someone like Amix Mani to have this style of photo, so it's quite different in terms of the orientation of how it came through at first. So, yeah. And you can do one more? Please. Yeah, the next one is, um, so this is a editorial slash collaboration shoot with another photographer I worked on with called Niall. So massive shout out to Niall. He's an amazing photographer that specializes in fashion and beauty. Um, we came to collaboration to come with an editorial concept with six to seven different female models, um, just bringing like a casual smart look into the whole concept and really just building a connection that really made sense in terms of bringing the world of fashion into a higher collaboration expectation so a music photographer meets a fashion beauty photographer which is two different categories and for us it really connected very very well and there was a great structure behind the ideas and i felt we delivered it very very well and i was really happy with the type of lighting i experimented with as you can see this has a slight effect of rim light with a slight shadow on the tint of the face. So it really has that mood, but that effectiveness of really adding emotion into the model of what she's trying to portray. So yes. Amazing, thank you. No problem. So yeah, let's now pass on to Esther Key and Chuck Noble. Yes, thank yes, yes. you for joining us today. Hope you're well. Hello. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, so yes, can, can both of you just introduce yourself, um, tell us your style of work and talk us through your best pieces of work. Um, Esther, would you like to start off first? Um, hello, I'm Esther. I do fashion and advertising mainly, a bit of direction. Um, been doing it literally my whole life. Both my parents are photographers. So, yeah, I mean, basically me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just talk us through and just give yeah, us a slide. Um, <laughs> yeah, there we go. Um, so yeah, just talk us through your images here of the overview. So the two on the left, um, 
it's a project I shot during the first lockdown, where I was thinking about people's mental states and how they're feeling extremely exposed and vulnerable. And really all they want is a bit of space and the kind of medical safety. Um, so I went around and photographed real people in their homes, nude, except for masks and gloves, obviously with social distancing, it's very long way. Um, and it's, it's just a personal project I've been working on. Mm -hmm. It's got a bit cold to do at the moment, but I'll carry on maybe. <laughs> the top right is for a lingerie brand and it's 27 real women to represent their 27 different sizes. And we literally just took the first 27 women who applied. So most of them had never modeled before. Um, it was like herding cats, but it was incredible. <laughs> so it's too many people. We did a video and then the photo shoot. Um, incredible. And then the bottom is just kind of quite one of my travel fashion editorials that we shot in Portugal. Um, yeah, good fun week of shooting. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yes, um, hi Chuck, would you like to introduce hi. to our audience? Hi, can you, so I'm not on mute anymore, am I? <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yes, yes we are. Good, uh, my name is Chuck, Chuck Noble, uh, fashion slash portrait and a little bit of art photography. Hi everyone. Uh, based in London, I have been shooting for quite a while. And um, it's something I'm very, been very passionate about. I've been lucky enough to work with some really cool clients, some cool stylists, creatives over the years, um, and hopefully continue to do a lot more of that. I think at the moment London is definitely uh, way ahead. You know, we're, we're we're miles ahead in in regards to creativity. There's there's a lot of talent that's out there, and I'm I'm happy to to be part of that, you know, so uh, that's what I do. Nice, thank you. Um, so yeah, so to kick off this um, panel discussion, um, could e each of you just tell us um, what made you pick up a camera in the first place and how did photography become your creative outlet? Let's start with you, Chuck. Um, I, I mean, I've always been into photography, uh, but I didn't start as a photographer, I, I, you know, as soon as I graduated from university, I went into business. Uh, and then photography was kind of a hobby at, at the time. But then um, years in, I realized that it was definitely something I wanted to concentrate a lot more of. I was working, you know, doing stuff as a photographer behind the scenes. I was running a modeling agency with my best friend at the time. And, um, you know, it just years and years of doing that, it just showed me that it was something I definitely wanted to get into. So as soon as we sort of wrapped up the modeling agency kind of part of things, I decided that, yeah, I'm going to focus a lot more on photography. So I quit my job in the city and, and that was it. I haven't looked back since. Uh, it was initially, you know, years ago, it was, how can I put it? It was a hard sort of industry to break into in the mainstream, you know, obviously on the urban scene, there was, there was a ton of us out there doing what we were doing. Uh, but where I wanted to be meant that I really had to get out there. I needed to change my, my, my style. I needed to change everything that I thought that photography was about because I felt that I had to, at that time I was kind of pigeonholed. So I really wanted to break out. And then, um, you know, once I made that decision, it was full steam ahead, basically. Thank you. And so both my parents were photographers. They did very different things, but it meant I picked up, I literally always had cameras around. I think I've got a photo of me when I was three shooting on an RB67, which is like the size of me. <laughs> um, and then I studied, I thought I wanted to do art photography, but I started modeling when I was a teenager for kicks and discovered I really enjoyed the fashion industry and like the fast pace of it. I think I work too quickly to be an art photographer. I get bored of my own work too quickly. <laughs> so I enjoy that and I really enjoy the team aspect of it and everything. So that's how I ended up getting into fashion. Did a lot of assisting and studio managing for various photographers. Nice. Learned the ropes that way. Thank you. Thank you, sir. 
Um, my background is quite different because I more come from the music world of the industry and I think the music industry is the far, most fastest growing industry that is currently going on alongside fashion. I think my inspiration comes from the world of film. So I started off as a videographer originally. So I was undertaking um, creative media level three at, at college. And then after that, I got into BA film studies in Middlesex from 2015 to 2018. And it was something I've always liked and something that I was into. But I did photography first as a side hobby when it came to that initiative. So I was just out and about just shooting other people, just really out there, just experimenting and seeing how things are going to be. And then one time, one of my good friends who I grew up with back in Ilford, who knew an artist called Paige Akeke, he then put me in connection with her. Originally, we were supposed to do a video shoot for her with an artist called Bonkers, which she had a video shoot treatment that she was prepared to do with. At uni, we had access to the equipment. We had a lot of stuff. So throughout that time, months passed by. She then posts a flyer on Instagram saying she needs a photographer for a birthday party. I didn't know anything about events photography or even anything that's correlated to that world. So... I thought, still, let me just take the chance and let me take the risk, see how far I can go. And then from there, I met numerous people. I really started to enjoy it. I felt there was like a higher adrenaline in terms of just being around like a lot of these cultural stars. But as well, it's just the fact that it really gave me an understanding of why I love listening to music at first, especially gram and hip hop, originally I'm from East London. So... I always said to myself, somehow, somewhere, I'm going to be involved in the music industry. So it really was a break, breakthrough point for me. So after that, I met a lot of people throughout that party, followed more numerous people's journeys. Throughout that, then I got into the world of music a bit more through like photo shoots behind the scenes, but as well as um, more events and shows. So... I really explored my identity furthermore and had fun with it to the point where I then brought the world of fashion into the mix because fashion and music now is such a big thing together and even separately as well. So I think now to the point where I've billboard campaign for like 20 artists worldwide. I've done shows abroad, I've toured around like with 12 artists all together in the space of four and a half years. And it's absolutely insane what the achievements have defined to be where I am today. So that's me in a nutshell. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Uh, Chuck, what advice can you give those who are new to photography or who are still building on their confidence? So what, what can you repeat that, please? Yeah. Uh, what advice can you give those who are new to photography or who are still building on their confidence? Um, I mean, I, I've always... I mean, when it comes... Uh, it, First of all, it, all it, it depends on the sort of person that you are in general. I've always said that when it comes to photography, it helps if you're a people's person. You don't, exactly, you don't necessarily have to be an extrovert or anything, but you need to at least have some kind of people's skills. If you're taking pictures of, of, of people, especially if you're taking pictures like the image um, that she showed earlier where she said it was, you know, women who, who are not models, who had never really taken pictures before, you need to be able to be the person who can at least make them feel relaxed about themselves. I think that's a natural thing that, that someone should have. If you're able to get someone else to feel comfortable about themselves, then that's a start. Um, but in regards to building your own confidence, it's to, number one, believe in yourself. Once you're able to believe in yourself that what you're doing uh, it's it you know you're not listening to what people are saying to you i've i've come across so many people over the years who are just not confident in their own work because they believe what other people yes you you know you will take criticism if someone criticizes your work you will take that uh, with heart you take that criticism and you work on it and, and you know you listen to what they're saying and not get torn up about it but the main thing is also believe in yourself. Once you believe in yourself and believe that what you're doing is unique to you, your skills are unique to you, there might be a million and one photographers out there, but your skills and what you offer to your clients or to anyone you're shooting is unique to you, then once you're able to believe in that, then you're able to believe in your confidence. I think 
where a lot of people lose their confidence is where they listen to people knocking what they do, listen to people, you know, telling them, well, your work is rubbish or it's never really going to get anywhere. Once you believe what people are telling you, then that's already going to knock your, your confidence. So I think the main thing is to listen to yourself, listen to your own heart, believe that, yeah, what I'm doing, even if I'm starting from the beginning, I'm going to work my way up to becoming a better photographer, a better creative, a better artist, a better whatever, regardless of what anyone says to me, regardless of what the industry throws at me, what doors are shut in my face. And the more you believe that and the more you keep on doing what you're doing, your confidence will build up. It's never going to be easy. It wasn't easy from the start for, for, I suppose, any of us here. But the fact that we persisted in what we're doing is the reason why we're here today talking with you guys. So I think that's the only way, uh, me personally, as much as I can allow or believe that other people can help me build my confidence, it, ultimately it's me that's, that's building my own confidence. And that is just believing in myself. Uh, it, it, I think it's a bit hard. It's, it's usually hard, especially for young photographers who I've you know, either mentored or whatnot, and they've, they've asked me the same sort of question. And I said, well, you know, what I'm saying to you right now is what I say to them. You have to believe that what you're doing, initially your work is never really going to be, you know, world class or whatever it is. But then that's for who to judge, you know, you know what is an iconic image? Um, so that's, that's how I tell people to build their own confidence, you know, build up a good portfolio. The more you build up a portfolio, then the more you get people to see your portfolio, take the criticism, whatever it is, but don't let it get you down. And the more that happens, the more your confidence builds up. But you always have to keep on working, you know. So that's how I, um, that's where I put it to. Um, in the chat group, we have someone says, "Why work is Um We have a question from Anthony uh, to Chuck. What is a good way to start to define your own style? And who's this one for me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I started photography years ago, I, you know, I was, I was shooting fashion shows on the urban, on, you know, when I say the urban scene, even though I, I don't like using that phrase, but, you know, I did so many fashion shows, I did so many music videos, I did, you know, it was, it was nuts. And at the time, my style was pretty much, you know, what was pretty much available at that time, you know, it was glossy, it was colourful, it was, it was all over the place. It took me a while to then finally settle on what I considered my style. And I think, to be honest, that happened when I started doing more of the mainstream um, work, when I started shooting for, you know, sort of like the mainstream magazines, you know, and I did a lot of sort of research at the time. And then when I went back to university and studied photography in university, that really helped me figure out what my style was and, and what I really wanted to do as a photographer um, and the sort of shoots I wanted to do and the sort of clients I wanted to work with. I mean, I, I looked at a lot of the, the photographers who I admired their work, their work, their progress, the process that they used. And, you know, and I realized that it's, it's not really about, you know, trying to throw everything in, in the kitchen sink at your images, but it's more about simplicity. Uh, you know, I've always looked back at iconic images of photographers who I've loved their work over the decades. And the one common thread through all those images, bar one or two photographers, um, is the simplicity of their work. And I think, you know, once you start stripping back everything that you think you know, um, and then just go and, and get your work so much more simple and, and, and you know, the you're not throwing everything that you want to throw at that image because that's everything that you've picked up along the way. You just kind of want to put, chuck it all in one image. It, it doesn't really show a style. It just shows that, you know, really and truly you're, you're still kind of trying to find your way. Everyone's going to do that. Everyone's going to get to a point where they've figured out where they, where they finally sit as a photographer. Um, but I think personally for me, how I found mine was, was obviously looking at the photographers who I appreciate their work not necessarily copying them, but seeing what made their work and their images and what made them sell as photographers and then realizing that actually this is what I like to shoot. And then I started figuring out that every time I did do a shoot, 
the way I edited my images were, were kind of similar to how I'd done the last shoot. The way I color graded was very similar. And I think that kind of whittled it down to how my, my style finally you know, came to be. But initially it was, <laughs> as with every photographer, it was pretty much, you know, what we, what I thought was what people wanted to see, you know, the kind of images people wanted to see. It was, it was nuts. It, it was, it was just color rights all over the place. <laughs> but, um, I think right now it's personally for me it's the, the the simple the more simple your images and look we can go nuts we can do the artistic stuff I, I i love doing artistic photography but what i realized is when i shoot for commercial clients you know they just they they want a, a, a images as simple as possible as they can be uh but then still be able to to, to tell the message that they want from them you know but one photographer who obviously is not a, a simple image photographer, who's one of my best or favorite photographers, it's Tim Walker. And, you know, being able to have his sort of style, which means he's, you know, he's got all the, the teams and the props at his disposal, also helps. So, yeah. yeah. Can you, I can't hear you guys. Can you hear me? The sound, the sound is quite muffled, guys. Guys, can't hear anything. No, no sound. It's off. It's disconnected. Yeah. Yeah, the volume's just really low. We can just about hear you, but it's a really low volume. <laughs> I'm trying to make it more vocal. Um, yeah, so it's quite relatable to what Chuck said. There's an actual quotation I follow by, be prepared for the unprepared. Real reason why I say that is you have to be ready for anything within this industry that I'm in. The music industry is quite interesting because you can get work that is super last minute, super last minute clients will come with you with a type of treatment that they want you to shoot with, whether it's for ill world campaign, whether it's for like an editorial, whether it's for behind the scenes, you just don't know the unpredictability of what factor that's going to come out. And I feel like in the world that I'm in, in, in especially with the music industry, there's, you have to be so authentic in what you are as an artist and a photographer and a creative. For example, like obviously Chuck has explained about the inspirations that like he looks at. Same likewise myself. I look at a really super high-end photographer called Neil Preston. For those who don't know about Neil Preston, he's one of the biggest music tour photographers in the world. So he's done tour photography for like Led Zeppelin, um, um, for Prince, many other diamond award-winning music artists all around the 80s and the 90s. And I feel Neil said it perfectly. He goes, with music photography, it's the, S, the art of beauty of it is when you capture the moment of it. 
Because when you define the moment within that photo that you catch up, it really defines why you started the journey for a reason. And I always go back to the question, I always relate to upcoming photographers. But if you're ever in a distorted moment where you feel things are not going right for you, you feel a lot of things that ain't coming through you in terms of the journey itself, go back to the question of why you started the journey. That's an important question you guys need to always figure through it throughout the journey that you took under as a photographer. Because we're here as cultivators of the culture. We're not here just for like, here to just do it for as a hobby or just for like, at first we do it as a hobby for the fun, but I think later on we realize it's more than just a hobby. But I feel in today's modern day society, especially young upcoming photographers, there's a lot that are coming without a purpose. Real understanding is have a purpose and why you're doing it and understand why you love it for a reason. For me, I think, as I said previously, I knew for a fact I was going to be somehow involved in the music industry. No matter what it was, no matter where it could be, as I said, meeting everyone, all these superstars all around me and working with the mainstream people as well, especially like major magazines as well, it was just a life-changing moment because I've got to really see the bigger picture with how everyone are as human beings. We all treat one, each other the same, but however, creatively, we are monsters without without craft because we just think of limitless ideas that break the boundaries. So I just think it comes down to the fact that understand your journey and why you started, always experiment, find ways of like having fun with the way you shoot and go to different scenarios of entering the realm of the music industry. As I said, I've done behind the scenes, I've done tours, I've done documentary photography, the music. It's really given me a way of finding my stance and my style. So that's how I found it. Thank you. Um, I think there's one thing that we all do and that's at times comparing ourselves to others. Yeah. Um, Esther, can you like tell us, have you done this yourself or have friends who do this? And if so, what can you share in terms of the best way to deal with that? Um, yeah, I used to do this a lot. I mean, I think everyone does it sometimes. I still do it sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, I think social media is amazing for loads of reasons, but it's so bad for this because you're constantly, you've got these curated feeds of everyone's lives and work. And, you're, and it's so easy to start going, oh, they're working all the time, oh, God, they're doing this, why am I not doing that? Mm -hmm. you just got to remember that actually people only post when they're having a good time, mm -hmm. not posting when they're not working. Um, and just try and shut that out. And, and keep an eye on the industry and what people are doing, because it's interesting, it's good to know what people are doing. But really just comparing yourself to other people only leads to being disappointed or bitter. You don't know how they got there, you don't know what's actually going on in their life, so it's just not, not worth helping, not worth doing it. So it sounds really cheesy, but I think it's better to compare yourself to yourself last year or last week or yesterday rather than compare yourself to other people. And is that the same with you, Chuck, as well? What do you suggest on ways people can deal with like preventing yourself from comparing yourself to others? <laughs> I can barely hear. Can you guys hear me? I can't. I can barely hear you guys. You know. Sorry. I don't. Question. I've I've got. Can you hear me? Yeah, can what hear was, you clearly, what, Chuck. What was the question? Um, what advice can you give um, to people about how to like not compare themselves to others? What What advice do I? What advice do you give uh, in regards to like not comparing yourself to others? All right. Um, I mean, <laughs> that. <laughs> I mean, in any, I suppose, in any profession, uh, there's always going to be some sort of competition. There's always going to be people comparing themselves uh, or comparing their work to someone else's work. And 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 the, the disadvantage of that is you're always going to believe that someone else's images, especially if it's someone that's been doing what they've been doing but way before you, is always going to be better than yours. Uh, social media, as much as we love it, has, you know, heightened that, that, that aspect. You know, we, we, as a photographer, you spend so much time on, say, things like Instagram, looking at other photographers' work, and then you're comparing them to yours, and you're like, 
you know, I could have done something better or, or my images, or blah, 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 whatever it is. So it's kind of hard to not be in that mind frame, especially when we spend a lot of our time on social media and looking and there's, you know, there's so much imagery out there. But like I said earlier before, for me, I, I have been through that and I still to some extent kind of compare my work to others' work. But now the way I kind of do it is instead of, uh, how can I say, instead of looking at someone else's work and thinking they're better than mine, I try to draw inspiration from those images instead. Uh, and that way I'm not sort of like kicking myself in the nuts, like, oh my God, you know, I'm doing rubbish and this person's out there doing way better than me. But instead I'll just try and, try and draw inspiration for it. See something about that image that I actually like. Um, and then I see, you know, how can I apply something similar like this to my work or, and just to be honest, just congratulate. You know, if there's someone out, if there's photographers out there that are doing amazing work, which there are, and I think the main thing is just congratulate what they're doing. There's there's enough uh, of the pie out there for all of us, and just get inspired by what other photographers are doing. Uh, you know, you can. There's there's no harm in taking little bits of, of inspiration from different images here and there, whether it's a color grade, whether it's a color scheme, but not outright steel, obviously. But um, I mean, everything we do has already been done, regardless of how you want to, you know, think that we're as unique as we can be. Everything that we've done has been done somehow, some way. So subconsciously, we're always taking, you know, taking bits of other people's work anyway and adding them to ours. Um, but I think it's always to see it as a positive and not to be caught up in this loop, this cycle of, you know, everyone else is doing way better than me or everyone else's images are better than mine. Um, comparing yourself. And I know people that do that. And like I said, I do it myself. But I know people that definitely compare their work. They're always talking about, you know, this person done something similar to mine, blah, 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 all of that. And I think that, like I said, it's to find a positive. Instead of beating yourself up about it, just, just find the positive of that image. Instead of comparing your work to that person, find a positive of what that person's done, congratulate them, you know, don't hate on it, but then, you know, take inspiration from it. Um, but then that's why for me personally, I, I love classical photographers, you know, the Norman Parkinson's, the Peter Lindbergh's, um, those are the photographers who I really love their work. So, I, I, you know, if I'm going to compare my, my images, I don't mind doing it with them because I know that them guys are way ahead, you know what I mean? Those guys were way ahead of what they're doing. But they're, they're, those are the people I love to draw inspiration from. Um, and also new photographers, but I love the greats. Yes, thank you. And talking about your inspiration, uh, can you just tell us about your work? Like what what uh, elements you incorporate in your piece of work? So let me just turn this up a bit. I can I'm not even, I swear down, I'm, I'm struggling to hear you guys. Um, can you repeat that again? Sorry, I really am sorry. Yes, can you just tell us what inspires your pieces of work? Like, what elements do you incorporate in your work? Um, I mean, because I sent some images. Would you be able to pull them up? Yeah, we can. Okay, so the... All right, hold on. Let me... All right, cool, 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 cool. All right, so, I mean... All right, now we'll start from this one. This, this, this image here was... I mean, this was during the beginning of the year. I mean, every image that I've kind of sent through has got a different sort of story behind them and a reason why... I sent them through and, and what they're about. This this image right here is obviously during the beginning of the year when we, you know, had the BLM protests and the lockdowns and, and um, you know, everything that was just going crazy at the time, rightly so. Uh, this, this was one of the images. Uh, this is a model who was also at the protest. And uh, what I noticed about the, the protests at the time and with any sort of protests that are happening and, and movements is the fact that photography over the decades, over the ages, has always been um, a factor in, in letting people know what's been happening uh, in the world. If you look at the way images have always been used uh, to, you know, to, to, to convey messages, uh, pretty much, I mean, you know, photography and imagery has, has, has molded what we see in the world and what we know about the world. So more so with what I saw during during the, the, the BLM protests and, and you know, the amount of photographers that were there capturing images. Uh, you know, the reason why we 
were out there in full swing capturing these images is is for you know generations to come to be able to look back and you know wherever they find these images online or in magazines or books or whatnot um, and they were able to look back at these images and know what was happening there for me it was as much as it was you know we were in the middle of a pandemic everyone was masked up the protests were not but it was also a very electric sort of period and electric time uh, to be involved in this and, and capture. So this is one of the images from that period. Um, I was I was very inspired by what I saw, not just obviously, you know, photography, but the fact that everyone of all colours uh, were out in full swing, uh, representing and, and fighting for a good cause. Thank you. Um, yeah, hello? Yeah, yeah. Which is the Yeah, so this image here, uh, this is IMDDB, who's an amazing, uh, amazing artist, the uh, UK, UK, uh, Neo Soul, R&B, I mean, she's just, just great as a, as a singer, but then also as a person, her, her vibe is just, it's just nuts. It's, you know, once you're around her, she's just got so much energy. Um, and positive energy that it just kind of grows on you. Well, I wouldn't even say it grows on you, it sticks to you, you know what I mean? So this shoot here I did, this this is a, a, a succession of images that I shot for British Vogue um, of IMDDB, and uh, I worked with an amazing creative uh, director and stylist, uh, Susan Bender, who's also my, you know, my best friend, and... Um, you know, we, 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 we create some amazing images from this. Um, it was, you know, the outfits were provided by where we worked with the Burberry collection or the Burberry monogram collection, which at the time had not been released. So uh, the images are not part of the ones I sent you, but it was, it, you know, we were lucky enough to be able to shoot that collection before the official launch. I think the launch was sort of like two or three days after we'd done the shoot or probably a week later. Um, so everything was just kind of falling into place. It was, for me, it was just great. You know, it wasn't the first time. I mean, I'd, I'd done quite a fair bit of shoots for British Folk before that, but this was one of the shoots that really uh, made me happy and, and to be doing what I was doing because I was able to shoot, you know, an amazing artist. We had a great location. Um, you know, it was for British Folk, which is one of my favourite uh, magazines, so, you know, I've, I've grown up as a big fan of Vogue, uh, and being able to get my work in there once again uh, was 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 quite a good thing for me as as a photographer. I mean, with any with any photographer, you know, uh, there's certain uh, how can I put it? You know, it's like with your CV. You know, if you're whatever whatever your craft is, you always want to sort of have certain. Uh, jobs on your CV that you know would help you get ahead. Um, you know, obviously Vogue is one of those if you're a fashion photographer. So, you know, it was a great thing to be doing. Thank you. Um, so is that, I know that you've got um, obviously some social media platforms that you um, what's the best way photographers can use social media productively and do their best advantage? Um, just use it as a way to promote your business. Uh, you really don't attach yourself to a world of social media problems, I think. I think with what I learned throughout the years is there's an actual terminology that I follow by, an actual thing that I name is perceptive. So really, so what I mean by that is reason why I say it is perceptive, meaning you're, you're aware, you're sensing, and you're seeing things across what social media tells you. So really doesn't mean you're living in a fantasy world. And I think the problem is when we compare ourselves and we always envy another person's journey, we have this factor for where we love to compare ourselves in a way where we live something, someone else's reality, but we're not living it out of reality. And sometimes it's so scary because when you're falling into that so it can really drastically affect your mood in many, many ways. Mentally as well, it can affect your con it can affect your conscious mind and your subconscious as well. And I think with us creatives, because we're always looking at different scenarios of inspirations, but as well as 
comparisons, we always want to be the best ourselves, but at the same time, we just don't feel we are at the best within what we can bring to the table. And I think that's what everyone that has been starting, even till now, that have been doing this for years and years, as, as I said, and Chuck said, it's just about really portraying yourself to be the best at what you do. And sometimes you need to detach yourself and have a break from social media because it's unhealthy. I, as a, as a person from my generation, I've realized that a lot of my people are from my, are my generation, they love social media too much. They love it too much to the point where it just becomes such a habit for them to really continuously use it. And they feel like they have to have somewhat of an opinion or some way to really prove to people that they're good at what they do. Forget that. You're there, just put your brand on, get people that really support you and appreciate what you do. And it goes by a lot of things. Yes, like you'll have, friends and families that will support you and go against you. But I always say, you will always get the unexpected support from people you least know from. And that's the reality sometimes of it as well that can be. And for me, you just have to use it as a marketing tool sector where market yourself with it, post up your stuff consistently, posting one or two things in the story about promoting your photos, check the social media. If you're looking at social media stuff, look at icons of photographers. Like, for example, I look at Gunnar Stahl from America, he's like one of the biggest music photographers in the States. He's an amazing film, I think medium format style photographer. The way he shoots his portraits and the way he documents music artists in the States is phenomenal. I look at his stuff and be like, you know what, like, even though I don't do film, but I've started to get into the world of film photography, I really like the type of abstract vibes he brings into these photos and the simplicity of it, but the effectiveness of the colors, the composition, the angles. And I feel when I take inspiration, rather than just comparing myself, there's a massive differentiation in that situation. And I feel it comes down to knowing yourself best. You are the biggest enemy within yourself. You are the person that can really deteriorate your, your mind and you can really become the biggest person within your own demise and downfall. And it's a scary thing, but at the same time, working on yourself at first is the best thing forward. Once you work on yourself and you really understand the journey that you're trying to go for, then everything makes a lot of sense in terms of how you have more ideas, what you want to create, and sometimes you want to bring to the table. Not every idea can come to life. Let's be realistic. Some ideas you want to think out the table, cool, but sometimes you need to have an expectation level, how you're going to deliver it, what's going to happen, you need to have people around you that are great, have great F, uh, uh, F, uh, what work ethic, and really understand the game like straight. If you feel like you can't set design, get someone to set design for you. Depends on the budget, depends on the obviously aspect of it's a collaboration, get people that are collectively around you that believe in your vision as well and you believe in their vision. Because I believe having a great team around you can make great things happen as well. And then there's always like minded people like that in the industry. I feel we're just afraid to ask a lot of people we've been numerous times, can we have you to give your expert opinion on this? Get out of that comfort zone. Sometimes asking is always the best way forward. You never learn to get asked. So that's the way I see things. Thank you, amazing. Um, Esther, um, have you been in a position where you know, you're working with a client or more than one client and you know, um, they're not being expressive on, um, expressive on set, but they're being a little bit shy? How do you deal with that personally, like professionally, but also put emotions aside you know, to get the work done? Yeah. Um, yeah, clients are a really difficult one because it can be such a tense time, especially I work with a lot of startups, sustainable brands, and maybe it's their first time doing a big budget shoot, so it's quite a stressful time. I think if you're just super confident, even if you're not actually confident, if you just come across super confident and easy going and that drops off on them and they can they'll, they'll pick it up and they'll calm down. What can be quite difficult is working with um, on documentary shoots or I did a shoot for uh, raising awareness for endometriosis and there were 18 real endo sufferers naked in the studio and it's like a lot of them have never really spoken to anyone else with endometriosis because they were tell it, telling their stories and they were crying everywhere and laughing everywhere and it was like so emotional. All I wanted to do was like put down my camera, sit with them, hear their stories, give them a hug. You mm-hmm. couldn't really do because it's just the beginning of COVID. We couldn't go near each other. But you kind of just got to learn how to 
step away from all of that and ignore your own emotions and get your job done because at the end of the day I need it to get a ridiculous number of push ups and in the long run that's going to do more good than sitting with them for 10 minutes um, and again which did it is sort of experience so I've assisted on a lot of charity shoots as an assistant here it's an easier place to learn that that you can actually just step away when it gets a bit overwhelming. Um, yeah, it's just it's just about practice and learning that balance of being empathetic enough that yeah. you you can get the best out of them and you understand them and you don't upset anyone, but then you have to put your own point of view and emotions aside. Thank you. Um, I don't know if any of you guys expressed a time where you know you thought you secured a job, but then you're still here and made a cut. Sharp um, book. Can you just provide advice on how people can deal with, you know, rejection in the best possible way? Um. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 yeah so can you can you repeat the question, please? Yeah. What advice can you give in terms of um, how to deal with uh, rejections? Oh, rejection. Yes. <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, I think that you know what the more the more you grow as a as a creative as a photographer, you know, then the better you are at handling rejection because there's you know no matter what you say to someone once they're starting and you you know once the, once once a photographer starting out from the beginning and then you try to drill it into their head to be able to accept rejection right at the beginning. It's just going to be so hard to get anyone to do that. That is something that they will naturally grow into uh, being able to deal with. Um, plus, it also comes down to what, you know, if, it, if it's, uh, you know, someone who's just starting out in whatever they're starting out in, and then they sort of segue into photography, it, it, say if they've been working in, you know, I don't know, some, somewhere else, a different industry before that, and they've been able to deal with rejection, say, going for job interviews. And they were able to deal with that. Then they'll probably be a lot more better at dealing with project rejection if they become a photographer. But if it's just someone just deciding that in general, um, you know, the only way they can do with that is is they will learn from that rejection. You can't just tell someone, though, you've got to deal with it from the, from the instance. The only way you can learn how to deal with it is by being rejected you know, I mean, I, I was rejected a million and one times. I suppose we all were, I can, I can only imagine. Um, and that's the only way I've been able to now deal with, and I still get rejected. There's still certain, uh, you know, jobs that I would like to get, but then I know that, you know, the client's either gone for someone else because, you know, either they couldn't afford me or God knows what not. And it will hurt. It does hurt. But then it's just the way you deal with, that uh, it is is dependent on how long you've been able to to deal with rejection. If it's just something you starting out, it's something that they will just have to learn how to deal with it. Because you're always going to get pushed back. You're always going to get rejected. You're always going to get. There's always going to be someone out there who doesn't like what you you're, you're doing at the moment. There's always going to be someone out there that's telling you, well, it's kind of cool what you're doing, but it's not what we want at the moment. You know, come back to us, blah blah blah, whatnot. And you need to hear those words. You need to hear that from whether it's clients, whether it's other creatives, whether it's from creative directors, because that's the only way that you will grow as a photographer. If you, if you from the beginning, just like getting everything come your way right at the beginning, then years or months later, if you do end up with a rejection, it will hit you the hardest because you, you've never been used to it. Um, so you have to you have to get those rejections. It's just part of life. The only advice I can give, in general, is when you do get rejected, don't let it, um, you know, don't let it make you decide. Well, you know what? I just this is not working for me. I'm just going to pack it all up because I've been rejected a few times. You have to get those rejections because that's the only way you're going to grow. That's the only way you're going to find out who you are as a creative, as a photographer, and that's the only way that you will find out who, what your strengths are and how strong you are as a person. You can't deal with the rejections at the beginning. Then, you know, it kind of, it, how strong will you be in the future when you start getting those big roles, when you start getting those big jobs and then things start happening where you're like, well, 
this shouldn't have happened or that shouldn't have happened. How will you deal with it? So you have my advice I can give really is take that rejection and grow from it. You know, we all have to, and it's it's just a part of life. You know what I mean? That's a part of life. I, if I could just say one more thing. Obviously, um, it, it's, it's, it's hard now. It's a lot harder these days, um, especially this year, this you know, S storm of the year that we've been through where, you know, people's mental health has been affected uh, so much, um, you know, because of the lockdowns, because of the virus, because of this, because of that. So people, you know, our health is so fragile at the moment. Our mental health is so fragile. So I can understand that, you know, being rejected for something, especially if you haven't been able to work for so long and then you're now trying to get this job here or that job there and you're being kicked out or turned down or do windows and doors are shut in your face um it's a lot harder to deal with and i can understand that because i'm going through the same kind of thing myself but um you know there is there is a there is there is a, a, a you know the sun will shine right at the end of this tunnel and we're all going to get through it and i think it's the best thing is to just kind of you know just stay strong the rejection is part of growing up it's because it's part of becoming who we are as, as photographers to be honest Thank you very much. My friend's got a big red baby. That's just a pound in the box. And then just twice as much treat at the end of the month. I can't connect it again. I'm getting a better treat. Yay! <laughs> 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 Music. Mm. Oh, sorry. When it comes to your personal work, how do you stop yourself from burnout or becoming overwhelmed, especially if you're running from command sheets now? It's simple. Like, it's that simple. Take a break. I think we creators just tend to forget we are human beings. In, in like in the, in the end of the game, like sometimes we just become so busy to the point where we just don't catch up with our own reality. Whether it's your loved ones, whether it's some people that are around your circle that you're, how should I say, you've got a lot of time for, even yourself as a person, you just don't have the time to really balance cohesively what your what your job is that makes any your your inner your inner conscious your bias. But as well as your physical body itself. And I can't lie, I think COVID was a perfect example, as I said previously on the last panel. Um, when we were speaking, I said, when I first had my eight hours of sleep in 2020, it was the best thing of my life. I was like, wow, like refreshed, revitalized, my energy levels were up again. And I just said to myself, yeah, I've missed out on a lot of sleep. And it comes and it catches up with you. It does catch up with you. And I can't lie, I have been in many occasions where I've been in the hospital, or I've been checked up numerous times. Even like throughout my journey, I've got this thing, this condition of fluorosis. For those who don't know what fluorosis is, it's like an inflammation between your lungs and your rib cage, and as well as your chest, that causes you to have chest pains and tightness. And the mad thing is, I don't even smoke or drink or do none of that. Thing at all. I'm a healthy boy, like I train, I'm, I'm made, I'm, I do a lot of workouts, I've got a strong diet in plan, but even the most strong and most healthy minded people can be vulnerable to a lot of things, especially if you don't take rest, if you don't look after yourself, and really just don't think about rest itself and just balancing and being organized, it really does take a toll on you within the long run. I noticed that. I remember there was a week where, I think it was two weeks, I was in between two tours. I was in Birmingham for one city. I had one in Pancho show, then straight after I found out he got had another show, he booked me in for last minute. Went back to the tour bus, I was absolutely shattered. And then the next morning, we drove all the way up to Manchester, woke us up at 9 a.m., went to the venue, done sound check, everything. Everyone done their thing for like three, four hours, cool, no problem. Then I get cool. I get a call next next during the same day. I got a shoot for you in London back the next day. Can you come down straight away? I went to London back the next day in the day when we had a day off of the tour. It was like a whole day shoot, eight hours. I was like knackered, and then straight after when that was done, I had to go back to Leicester for the tour. And it was just like, when am I going to ever rest? Like, when is my body going to rest? But at the same time. These things, we do it because we love what we do. 
And we love it because it's something that we embrace from the start and we embark on. So it's really a thing where you love that you love the whole job and you love what you do and the passion of it, but at the same time, like please understand health and wealth comes first before anything. People will understand it. I'm telling you now, there's been situations where I've placed these calamities and I've nearly been I've nearly collapsed, I've fainted numerous times. And even this condition I have, like it's somewhat somewhat of a new battle for me that I face and for me it's been a, a challenge but at the same time I know for a fact I'm always going to come on top because I know for me I see myself as a conqueror of conqueror of things I don't stand down by anything I know for a fact anything that comes to me that's a challenge whether it's rejection whether it's your balancing your health whether it's something that's going to condition you to feel bad or even feel unhealthy I know for a fact I'm a champion of what I do and I'm realizing I can make things happen but it's about realizing how to really take care of yourself more than anything at first. So yeah. And just quickly as a swept box, um, what types of self care do you take on um, to keep a clear and chip when it comes to work? Um, I'd say no jobs, which is the biggest that's the biggest thing. Where if I've got a really busy month, I just turn turn stuff down, that's fine. Um, and I I think it's quite hard, especially with projects to be creative when it starts out with a hobby, it feels like you're doing a hobby. So it's very hard to push off and separate your work and personal life. I used to end up working until 4 a.m. Not because I was a deadline, just because I was enjoying working. And it's, you just burn out and it's just not good. So now I've got little tricks like if I'm working tomorrow, which is a lot, the price for a lot of people now, Take a little walk in the morning and in the evening, and then your work day is in between those two walks, and then you go, you don't do anything else. You turn off, you switch everything off, mm-hmm. you relax. Uh, so that's my way of doing it, and making sure you get some exercise as well. It's also very easy to just sit at home and not talk to anyone, mm-hmm. recharge for a week and not move. Yeah, so, so yeah just little, any little tricks you can do to separate mm-hmm. work time and day time, I think mm-hmm. is really important. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a question from Serene. Can you hear us, Serene? Um, yeah, I can hear. Um, hi. Um, just wanted to quickly ask, um, on the subject of mental health, do you think that photography is a good outlet? Uh, well, can I ask it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know what? I, I, personally, for me, totally. Um, you, know, look, you know, as much as you know, I don't really want to go into personal details, but you know, from for dealing with things like depression or anxiety, um, you know, it's always suggested or advised by you know the professionals that try and find something that you do that you're passionate about that you can sort of devote your your attention your time your mental time to for me you know photography as much as it's my profession it's my passion i you know i i i can divide the two you know i can split between it being a profession and then it being you know something i do in my spare time sometimes it's hard to you know to split the two apart but one thing i do know is that whenever i do have a camera with me you know, whatever else I'm going through in my life, in my time, whatever whatever time of the day, whatever time of the year, month, whatnot, you know, I, I forget about that. You know, but the camera is, it, it pretty much absorbs all that, you know, whatever you want to call it, negativity or whatever it is. I'm in my element when I've got a camera in my hands. I'm in my element when I'm shooting people, when I'm, when I'm making someone feel good about themselves, when I'm making someone feel happy about themselves. I'm in my element when I'm able to bring someone else's, uh, you know, dreams or visions uh, or ambitions to reality and how that makes me feel, um, you know, if I'm going through a bad period, what not, being able to then, you know, absorb my whole energy into use, into my camera and being able to do. I think for me personally, yeah, it's definitely a good outlet to release that negative energy um, and, and, and you know, just take up a camera. And it, it's worked wonders. And, and I, over the years, I've read a lot from other people who have said the same thing. 
the photography has helped them so much also. It's helped them deal with, uh, you know, depression. It's helped them deal with, you know, just that lonely feeling, that feeling of not being able to, to continue with whatever it is you're, you know, you're going through at the time. Um, and it's not just about shooting people too, you know, if, if you're kind of taking a camera and just going for a walk and, and shooting things that you see and being able to, it's a different feeling from just going for a walk and just looking at things with your eyes, which I, which I totally, um, you know, appreciate people doing. But then once you're able to, to, to see that, compose, see something with your eyes, with the camera, through the lens, compose that image, take that shot, take it back home, look at it remember the feel how you felt when you were taking that image i think personally for me there's just so much that can help in dealing with things like anxiety i know people that who have never been able to really interact with other people but then once they've got a camera in their hand they've got a reason to interact with people. they've got a reason to um you know, go up to people and talk to people and feel confident enough to talk to people because they have a camera, they have a reason because they have that camera. And through that, they learn how to now deal with being able to not have that camera with them, but then still be able to converse with people or interact or, or open up and, you know, crack this shell that they've uh, pretty much uh, encased themselves in. So personally for me, I think, you know, and I can't speak for other, you know, vocations and whatnot, but I think personally for me, photography is definitely a, a good way of dealing with, you know, mental health and just being able to, because one of the, one of the main aspects of, of, especially with depression is that isolation, you know, that, that just being indoors and not being able to go out. You don't feel like you have a reason to leave your, you know, that, that cage, that box that you're in. Once you have a camera in your hand, there is a reason. You know, I can go out there and don't really talk to people or whatnot. I've got a camera in my hand. I have to go out and shoot. The more that, that camera is helping you get out there, and, you know, I mean, there's no point in shooting around your house four hours a day. You want to get out there. And the more you're able to get out, the more you're able to get out and see sunlight or, in the case of London, great clouds, whatever it is, it will help you. And that's one of the main things which any, you know, mental health professional, the first thing they'll tell you is you need to try and get out. So if you feel like you don't have a reason to get out, you know, even the cheapest camera would give you that reason. So that's my, that's my opinion, really. Amazing. Thank you. Um, where can people find your chat online? Sorry, what did you say? Can you just tell us your socials before we wrap up? Oh, my social? Yes, please. What it is? Yes, yeah, so where people can find you. When you're oh, right. Uh, yes. I don't even know why I'm leaning in as if that's it. Um, yes, it's at Mr. So M R C H U C K Chuck Noble, N O B L E. And that's at uh, Instagram. My website's also chucknoble.com. So that's C H U C K N O B L E dot Again, so yes, we've come to wrap now. Thank you again for everyone, Zek Snaps, Esther Key and Chuck Noble for joining us. Um, and thank you to our viewers who stayed with us the whole evening, um, the whole evening, whole mm -hmm. afternoon. Um, I hope you all enjoyed it. But be sure to uh, tune in next week's uh, cinematography masterclass and panel discussion, which will be hosted by Cheyenne. Um, but yeah, that's it from me. I'm the, your host, Kia Fullerton, at Renaissance Studios. And again, thank you again, and see you next time.